Hi guys, welcome to a brand new tutorial. Today we're going to be having a look at the brand new input manager from Unity themselves. The input system is in preview 0.9, so um, if you've seen video around, if you've seen any other documentation covering packages before that, then it might have changed a little bit. So what I will be showing you in this video is how I personally implemented the input manager, the new input manager inside of my motor state machine. So that is the state machine. You can download that anywhere. It's on the website. It's on my GitLab. Um, both those links will be in the description down below if you want to check it out. And I'll quickly cover and go over it right now. This is the completed project. Um, as soon as we start the tutorial, you're going to see something different, the old version of this project. So there is multiple way to go about implementing this new input system. They give you a lot of entrance, you could say, different things you could do to actually have this working new game. Um, what I'll be showing you today is the player input method. It's actually, I don't know if it's really a method, it's something I came up with um, using this and also using my input manager script, which is something I had in the past. What I used to do in the past is I had an input manager that was static and I would call, hey, is this button down or what is my um, axis on, on the left joystick and right joystick or something like that. Now I still do something very similar, so my input manager over here is static instance and down here it has public property. So these are the only two I'm parsing and I'm going to be showing you in this video. It's very simple. So one of them is an axis, so the move input direction, and the other one is a button, so in this case a boolean. So to give you a quick glance on how this works, basically you have events that are being mapped to your controllers. So that is your mouse, that is your keyboard, that is your gamepad, that's your HTC Vive, that's your Kinect. It can be pretty much anything. And do note that if you tell your game, hey, I'm only gonna have a keyboard and a mouse, then it's not gonna be listening for anything else. So you can like, you can make this a little bit more optimal by just targeting specific devices, you could say. Now, when those devices send a information, a triggered event, say for a button, if I press on my jump button, which in this case was spacebar or um, the south <laughs> button of a controller, a gamepad, then it will call the unjump function. This unjump function will just set jump to through for that frame. And then if you see over here, I have another function that will reset these action every frame. And one of the thing that um, you might actually like is that we can actually choose whether or not we want our input to be processed in the update or fix update. And I know this is a big deal for some of you because you want to have your raycast in a fix update because you want them to be as accurate as possible. But then if you did like a um, a raycast on the button, so if you only raycast when you press a certain button, you couldn't really do that because then the input, you might miss some inputs. If you put the input in fix update, that used to have a couple of messy settings, sometimes you would miss some input. Well, now you can actually do that. You just have to make sure your update mode is set to process event in fix update. So here I just parse in between the two and then I go ahead and call my reset. Now, one thing I'd like to point out before we go any further is that for this very specific implementation, what I do is I reset input every frame, as I've just told you. However, these over here, um, assuming I'm just pressing on the jump button, these, we don't really know when they're gonna be called. For the sole purpose that, um, you know, they're they're called from my devices. So th those are events called from my devices. So what I have to make sure is that I only do this, I only run my update loop at the very end of my frame. So if I press on a button, um, I want that button to be toggled to on. And then whatever I use in my script, so over here let's open an example, if I'm walking right now and I want to check if I'm jumping, by the way this used to be the way I was looking for it with my old input, um, but now I just have to check, okay so jump, jump like this. Um, if I want to do that, I gotta make sure that jump is not turned off before I look at it. And that means this update loop has to be running at the end. So something that was important for me to do for this very specific setup is to head over to the project settings script execution order and I put my input manager at the very end of everything. So this is for the update loop, basically. And right before we get started, let's have a look at what the input looks like. It's gonna look something like this. You're gonna have your action map, which are for my player. Then the player can have multiple action, jump or movement in this case. Those are only the two action I have. And there is different control scheme based on which device we're using. So if we're only using keyboard, then only these will show up. I can only jump using spacebar and I can only move using WACD or arrow keys. If I'm using a gamepad, I can only jump using button cell or the joystick, left joystick. So 
that's a big overview of what I've been doing here. Now let's go ahead and try to implement this. To get started with the new input manager, you have to add on the window and download the new package. Just give it a some time and then all the packages will be loaded. This one is still in preview, so you'll need to do show preview package. However, it's at version 0.9, it's very very close to being released. But just go ahead, type in input and wait for your internet to actually fetch this package. Ah, here it is, so version 0.9 and I'm gonna hit install. Once the new system is installed, you'll see this pop up and you'll have to accept it. So this basically says that the old system is currently in place, we want to replace it with the new system. So let's go ahead and hit OK. And from that point on, the old system should not work anymore. So the second step you should take after creating, not creating, but importing the package is go under Edit, Project Settings, and then go under the New Input System Package, which is right here. So it says we have to create a new setting asset. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'll call mine... Actually... <laughs> I don't have to call anything, I just press the button and it created one for me and that's gonna be fine. So it gives you a dot .input setting and it looks something like this when you open it. So it's a simple object that Unity creates and all of these settings can be also modified directly when you click on it so you'll see that directly in the inspect uh, or never mind, it's in the input setting window, so over here. Now the first thing you'll see in the setting over here that I think is interesting to you is a lot of you come up to me and say, hey, um, I wanna do Raycast but I wanna do it in the fixed update because it's a little bit more accurate but I want to do Raycast on mouse click or on spacebar click on something like that. Uh, but you know, we can't really look for inputs through the fixed update. Sometimes you miss them. Well, now you do have that option. You have the option to process the event in the fixed update. So you can change that right here and you'll be able to do the Raycast um, in the fixed update on button press. Okay, now the next couple of things we're going to have a look at is Dead Zone. That is mostly for the joystick. Dead zone, if you're not aware, is if you have a loose joystick, just a little bit loose that's not directly in the center, it, it actually might go in the direction, right? And that direction would be triggered. If you put a dead zone around it, so if I put a, let's say, a 0.5 dead zone on this thing, it means that as long as I don't push my joystick 0.5 or like 50% of the way towards the right, it's not going to be registered as an input. So it's very important to have, else you're going to have some freaky behavior. And the last thing I will mention in this window is the supported devices. Now, if you leave that empty, it's actually going to look for all the devices. And have a look at this. There is quite a lot. So you have the game pads, you have the joysticks, you have the pointers for pens, for mouse, for sensors. You have a lot of things. So all of these from mobile as well. Um, didn't even know we had a gravity. <laughs> but yeah, you could have a gravity sensor. And all these things are here. So. Right now, as you're developing, maybe don't put anything in there. Maybe you want to be looking for the inputs from all the devices. But when it comes down to pushing your build to production, if you're making a build just for Nintendo Switch, then of course, just put Nintendo Switch in there. What this will do, it will narrow down the scope of um, the input system. It will make it a little bit smaller. It will make your runtime a little bit faster. So this is like a, some kind of optimization, you could say, towards the end of the project. In our case, um, we are not going to put anything in there, but this is mostly for keyboard, mouse, and gamepad. So I don't plan on supporting anything else with this. Maybe AR, VR at one point. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this. We now have our input settings, but that's not it. That's not close to being done yet. Now we have to create our axis, the equivalent of axis in the past. So let's go ahead, right click, create, and at the end over here, you'll find input action. So I'll go here and I'll say this is player input action. This is something that's going to be related 100% to the player movement or to the player, um, the game, like during the runtime. So I want this to be loaded only when the game scene is on, not during the menu, not during cinematics or anything like that. Okay, let's open it up. I think you can double click on it, yep, or you could click on edit asset at the top here. Now let's expand this window. This window is quite, um, it's quite something when you first open it. We first start with action maps, into actions, into property. We're going to go through every single one of them, but do note that to have one, you need to have one, um, to have, say, an action, you'll need to have an action map, and to have a property, you'll have to be selecting an action. So what I've done right here is I've created myself an action, and it kind of crashed. We got some error. It's still a preview package, um, and it automatically created a action map. This is what I want. So let's go back, try to delete this. And we'll do it properly this time. I'm going to click over here at the top. I'm going to say, this is going to be an action map for my player, right? Just like we said a second ago, um, during the runtime. Now, what kind of action do we want our player to do? 
The first action I'll have is say a jump. We had that in the old axis, uh, the old way of doing things. We had that by default, so that was minded on spacebar and probably like joystick button zero, something like that. So we've created an action, but this action now takes binding, and those binding are what will map to the specific input. So let's have a look at what we have over here. If, now, if we click on jump we look at properties, this could be like your your inspector to some kind of field. Like it's, uh, we're looking at whatever we're selecting over here. So if we look at jump, we are looking at this and say, okay, so what is this gonna be? This is gonna be a button press. I want the jump to be a button press. Interaction, what could the interaction be? Okay, are we looking for just a press, a slow tap, a hold? Are we tapping? Um, tapping would mean on a touch device. And then the processor. What do we want to do with this action? Do we want to clamp it, assuming it was a value instead? Do we want this to be an axis? Do we want this to... I'm not quite sure what these are. <laughs> but for, for later, say for the movement, we want to normalize the movement so we don't have some uh, 1.3 of length vector when we try to go in diagonal. If you don't understand that, don't worry, I'll explain it again in a moment. But uh, let's go ahead and go down to the binding. So we have the jump action. We say, okay, so what are we going to be binding this to? Well. When you click on the path over here, you'll have multiple options. So let's think about it. How do we want to be doing a jump in our game? Well, we could be doing space, the keyboard. So just by doing that, now I have a space on the keyboard and it is going to be called a uh, jump. That's, that's fine. We have our first input. So now by pressing on space, we are going to call the jump action. Now that's only one of the input we'd like to take in case uh, we want to jump, but we also want to be taking another button, like say the joystick button. When we press on A on our controller, we'd like to jump. So how do we create a new binding? Well, we just create on, we just right click on the action, and then you have all these options. So add binding, add 1D, or add 2D. So let's start by I had a simple binding. It's exactly the same thing, it's just like a one more button. Exactly the same thing, but now let's go through the list and find the one we need. So what do we need exactly? We said that we want to have a gamepad, which is a controller, and then we could do the button towards the south. And the button towards the south could be the one closer to the second joystick if you're looking, say, at the uh, Xbox controller. So let's use that. So button south. And just take the time and have a look through all of these things. You'll see so many different input. So many different input. It's, it's crazy, actually. Okay, awesome. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and just collapse this one for now. We're going to be having a look at the 2D binding in a second. But first, we have our jump. Um, for our game, we need a little bit more than that. We need to be able to move as well. So right here, we saw how to do simple button press. Well, simple action being called by simple bindings. Let's go ahead and create another one for move. We can call that movement. And how do we go and move? So what I will be doing for this is I'll right click and add a 2D vector composite, which is going to create this kind of thing. So it's a big mess, right? It's full different input, but this is for up and this is also for down. So let's say I want this to be my WASD keys. We're gonna start like that. You'll figure out exactly what this is in a moment. And I'm, I'm gonna make sure to delete the old one. I don't wanna be calling movement on the simple grid. So, okay, WASD, that's fine. Let's do W, down is S, left is A and right is D. Awesome, so we got this one down. Let's do another 2D vector. This could be arrow keys. So up, and finally right. So I've got all of them done now for the keyboard. Oh, wait, actually this one is wrong. I said Android joystick, so that's that's my bad. Uh, it should be S for just the, the key. So where is my key? Over here, so S for the keyboard. Okay, so that's good. We've got the keyboard covered, but now we also want to get the joystick covered. So how do we do that? We create a 2D axis once more. And we're going to say this is for um, joystick left, left joystick. And the bindings are fairly similar. So we're going to look for, say, not a D-pad. We're not looking for a D-pad. We're looking for actual sticks over here. Left stick. Up, down, left, and then finally right. Good. Now, one thing you're going to notice is that we got three different sets, but these two are for keyboard and mouse. You could say just keyboard, actually, in this case, but they're for keyboard, and this one is for joystick. Um, maybe we don't, we don't want that, actually. We don't want to be looking for joystick input if we're just using the keyboard. So we have the option to do that in the new input system, and you can do that through Control Scheme at the top of here. 
So let's go ahead and create a new control scheme. This one's going to be for keyboard, mouse, you could say PC. And then what we'll do is that for that very specific scheme over here, we're going to add a new device and that device is going to be a keyboard and also a mouse. Let's hit save. And now you'll find out that uh, you're not quite sure what happened, right? But over here at the top, keyboard and mouse is going to show up. Okay. Now I'm going to create another one since we're here because we got more than just a keyboard and mouse. We also got the joystick, or I like to call it gamepad. Um, it's no longer called joystick. <laughs> so let's go ahead and choose joystick. Sorry, gamepad, like so. Hit save. And then you'll see that over here on the all control scheme, everything is still there. If I go on gamepad only, somehow everything is still there. And keyboard and mouse, everything is still there. But you'll find out that on the right hand side over here, where the bindings are, you have the option to assign this to a keyboard and mouse, or a gamepad, or both in that case. So I'm going to go at the top over here and say that if you press on space, this is actually just for the keyboard and mouse. And if you press on button south, this is actually just for the gamepad. And by doing so, now I'll be able to separate these two. So let me go back. If you don't have anything over here um, selected, it's just going to assume that it's for global, so everything is going to be involved. But that's not true. For WASD, ASD, this is going to be for keyboard mouse, keyboard mouse, and keyboard mouse, yep. Same thing for these four. There, let's make sure I don't miss any. And for the joystick. Alright, so we got that out of the way. Now, with all of them having a specific assignment, if you go under gamepad, you'll see that these are the only thing you can do with a gamepad. So you can only call jump with button south and you can only move with the joystick left. However, if you're on the keyboard and mouse, you have the same option. So you can only jump with spacebar and you can only move with either this or this. Cool, 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 cool. I think we got enough to test this out. Let's go ahead and save this asset. Now what we're going to be doing is we have to link this to our code. We have to actually do something with this. Alright, so right now for the implementation, I went into a new scene, created myself a player and also created myself a new script called playermovement.cs. Let's open it up. It's right here. And here is what we'll do. We'll first start by... I'm going to first start by showing you something very simple. So in case we're prototyping, we're trying to go fast. We're trying to prototype something. We don't really want to create an action um, settings like we've done a little bit earlier. Instead, we just want to do something if I press on a certain button. There's a way to do this, it's very simple. Say you want to do keyboard, you can say keyboard, just like so. Then you'll need to import the Unity Engine input system, just like so. And then after that, you can do, oh, the current keyboard, the one that's currently active right now. I want to be looking for the F key. Okay, not F, F is too complicated. So the P key, no, okay, O key. Any keys are there. You can go through the whole list, you're going to find a lot of them. So right shift, uh, R key. If I want to press on R, and I want to look if that key is held right now. I can do not was press this thing. This is a boolean that will let you know. Um, this is basically get key down. This is get key up. If you want to get um, just get key, I think it's held or is pressed. Here it is. That's the one I'm looking for. And that's also a boolean. So you have a boolean right here that's going to take care of what you want. So this is the fast way of doing things. In case I want to do, say, um, debug the plug, not log error. I have a debug the plug that says our key is being held. It's currently running in an update, and I have that during my scene over here. So if I do this, I will not even have to go through my input system. I won't even have to go through the player action I've created a second ago. I just have to say, hey, um, wait, 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 is that? All right, so I had to close the engine because I had a small problem. Um, so what I've did over here is that I've tried to run this, but I could not get it to work. I could not get this um, debug.log to show up. Now it should though. Yeah, so it's actually being shown properly. Now, um, what was happening earlier is that because we, we changed the input system, the old one was still working and I thought that was normal. Um, I thought this was like a bug or something. But it turns out that because we did not restart the engine, then um, we could not run the new input system. The, the switch hadn't been done properly. And I was able to tell that by going under Window, Analysis, and then Input Debugger. It's going to actually give you this thing over here. And uh, the Input Debugger, if I just put it back to how it was a second ago, looks like this. I had zero devices. 
And like when you're on computer, usually you have a, a mouse and a, and a keyboard. So um, I could not find these two and those were not being supported right now, which is why I was not able to get any inputs. Um, so just by restarting the engine, now I was able to see that these two are right here. And by doing so, um, from that point on, things started working once more. So I thought this was a nice opportunity to show up the input debugging window. So it's down here and you can do things such as add devices not listed in supported devices. So as you're creating your game, as you're testing out your game, you can put those in here even though you're not building for very specific things. So if I don't put the gamepad in here, um, we can still filter, like the editor can still go through these inputs anyway. Okay, so having that out of the way, we know how to look for a key in a very, very simple manner without having to go back on these things. Maybe I should have shown that at the beginning. Probably I should have actually shown that at the beginning. All right, now let's forget about how we just implemented this and let's do it the hard way. The hard way that's more flexible, however. So there is a component that you will import that actually is already there if you pull the package called player input on its own. Not player action input, not anything we created, but one from the Unity engine input system. So over here. So let's go here, say player input, and here it is. We get this type of mess. And at the top over here, you'll find something that you're probably familiar with by now. It's the um, action set, which we can just drag and drop over here. Now with that in place, you have multiple options. So we have different default control scheme. And for us, we're going to be using keyboard and mouse because we're in the inspector. The default action map, maybe the one that you want to be loading at, at the first thing that happens in the game is this. Um, UI input model, not going to mess around with that camera as well. I haven't seen the use of it just yet. And then the important part over here is send message. So on top of this very specific game object, when these events will be called, these will show up. So on device loss and on device regain. So those are a very simple event that you can now put on this model behavior in any script on this model behavior and it will actually take care of uh, telling you whether or not the device was lost or regained. So that's either you plugged in a new controller or you plugged in a mouse or plugged in the keyboard and so on. Now you're going to realize when we put that on broadcast message that they've created two new functions here. So on jump and on movement. And those are actually based off what we said. So we've created an action called jump, another action called movement, and they have created callback that they will automatically call from our script in case um, we press on those device. So I'd like, I actually haven't tried this one out. Let's actually do that. So I'm going to go over here called my function on jump, like so, and I'll do a debug.log. See if we get a jump action over here. Huh, that's actually quite interesting. So as I press on my space bar, I get the jump event. The next thing we're going to be looking at is the unity event. And then as you see over here, we're going to have those two events that they gave us initially. So have we found a new device or have we found, um, have we lost a device? But then they're also going to pull out your action set. So player in this case, and then all the thing that you saw over here. And you'll find out that we do have a callback context for these two. So the jump and the movement over here, they should work. So as I go and I press on plus over here, then we have the option to say drag and drop the same object, find my player movement script and go ahead and say, Hey, I want to do the jump function, but they're not public. Yeah, they're not public, that's why. So let's do public. Um, and public on this one as well. And you'll find out that they do receive a parameter, an entrance, it's called callback context, and this one over here does take it, this one doesn't. So let's see if we get any problem with that. So I'm gonna go ahead, drag player, it's done. Player movement. On jump still exists, however, we're not sending it the context, and over here movement player input actually movement and let's see, does the other one exist? On movement, dynamic callback context. It's gonna be at the top over here because it sends you this value. Okay, so having these two things in mind over here, what can we do next? We know that um if we press on spacebar, this should be called. How do we actually look for an axis right now? Well, this is how you look for Nexus. You'll need the context of that very specific um, action, and then you have to read the value of that action. And you'll read it through a vector 2. And this is how you do it. You can put that in the field, so say um, input or axis, you could say. And then if you want, we can debug the log. Just like a normal vector 2 is going to show up, down, left, right, um, number in between 
minus 1 and 1 for both axes. So as I run this right now, oops, sorry about the noise, we're gonna hit play and let's see if our two callback work just fine. So I'm pressing on spacebar, I'm getting the jump, I'm actually getting jumped three times if you notice, it's actually quite a lot, so we're gonna look into this in a second. And then if I press on A, and I'm holding A, you'll see that it's being called twice, but we get minus one. As I release, nothing's being called when I release, that's actually, that's actually quite hot. <laughs> and if I move around now, I get some kind of behavior, but it doesn't seem to work all the time, which is bothering me. Alright, so quick stop, as I wanted to know what was wrong, what I've done is I've actually removed my input action set and I've created one by default. They actually give you one by default, they don't want to show you because I want to walk you through the window, but here's what they have by default. They do use the same exact um, type of movement as we do, however the value is not set on axis, it's actually set on vector 2, and then everything beneath it is, say the WSD is also a 2D vector, so that was our problem right here. Let's imagine I never created this thing. And let's go back to debugging what we currently had. So I've put my action input back in there. Let's open it again. Go under movement. We're not looking for nexus, we're actually looking for a 2D vector. And then on top of everything over here, I want to have a 2D vector that is, yes, normalized. That's very important. Else we're going to get a vector that is too long, which means um, if we have one in X and one in, in the Y, the magnitude of that vector is going to be 1.3, and that might mess up your speed. You see that in older game where uh, they don't normalize and you go faster when you run in diagonal. Okay, so I found a way to get our behavior to work. Now, I did a little bit of experiment and it turns out that if I put my movement on action type pass through, as in we're passing through the value instead of just a um, specific value, then I could get this to work. So control type was still vector 2D. And then as I went over here and disregard this error, it happens when I close. When this is under pass-through, so the action type is under pass-through, I now have the desired behavior. So when I hold, I get this. When I release, I get a change. So now we're back to this. And this is actually the type of behavior we want. So we don't want to do something in the update for so long because um, what could be happening over here is that we'd be calling this event every single update and that could be really, really expensive. So if I just hold my button in a certain direction and I don't move for a little bit, then this is only being called once and you can only change your input vector once during that time instead of constantly checking for it every frame. Now I'm not saying that it's going to kill your game, it didn't kill our game in the past when we were doing it, but uh, hey, we have an option to do it better now, so might as well use it, right? Alright, so this will conclude the quick look at Input Manager. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go and implement this within my, um, my state machine, movement state machine, and I will be releasing the code as soon as it is done. So the code is already out there on the website, so if you head over to our website, you're going to find out that this has been released a little bit of time ago, and it's the movement state machine. So initially what you saw in the first scene. Um, yeah, so I'm actually going to be pushing the code from this video after I'm done revamping the whole system. Uh, in the past we had something like this, let me quickly show you. So input manager, this is what we had in the past and we're going to change it for this event type system. So as you can see, it is quite a mess, right? So we're going to be changing that um, fairly soon. And as I've mentioned, it's going to be on the website right here. You can hit download and once it loads, it's this one over here. Alternatively, you can also head over to my GitLab. So under GitLab, Michael Doy on motor controller. This is the same exact thing, but it's through Git. And it's much better to get it this way, simply because if you get it this way, um, you also get the project settings and also the the packages, so you don't need to go back and re-download the package, like re-download the machine, which I'm using, and also re-download the input manager. So I recommend you get it through here if you're interested in seeing the final product. Alright, so I hope this clarified this introduction to the new input manager. Um, I've actually been researching on it a little bit before, and it was... I've got some outdated stuff, so outdated um, documentation and also updated tutorial videos. So hopefully this one is up to date and you guys um, can have a good look at it, get started, start merging your game towards this type of system instead of the old one, as it is something we're probably going to be using a lot in the future as we move our engine towards dots and all that kind of cool stuff, more optimized stuff. So thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in knowing what the hell I'm doing with my life for some reason, you can go over to my personal channel in which I release 
Uh, some vlogs right now, at the moment, because I'm in India, <laughs> working here. So uh, some sometime we got some interesting stuff happening, so you can head over there and check that out. And thank you so much for everybody who's supporting. I will see you soon. Cheers.